Welcome to Orthopod, a podcast about the people of orthopedics and their stories. We understand that we all play many roles in our careers and lives, and it is these very stories that ultimately inform our successes and failures. This is Mo Bendari, and we're here with another episode of Orthopod. I'm here for a very, very interesting discussion, and a discussion I believe is not told enough and not discussed enough. I'm here with Dr. Ivor Mendez, who is the professor and provincial head of the Department of Surgery at the University of Saskatchewan and the Saskatchewan Health Authority. Welcome, Dr. Mendez. Thank you, Mo. So let me start off um, for those who are watching, um, may not necessarily know all of the rationale behind this, but you, I believe, are a pretty strong proponent that surgery and the humanities go hand in hand. And in fact, I presume that surgeons with an interest in humanities may in fact be better able to manage in the complicated world that we're in than those who do not have that purported area of focus. Can you talk more about this issue? Sure. You know, I do do not only believe that surgery and the humanities are complementary, but I feel that there are synergistic activities. Right. You know, as surgeons, uh, we, uh, of course, focus on... uh, uh, our technical ability to operate a patient, you know, our diagnostic abilities. We use science to advance uh, surgery and uh, advance our treatments uh, for our patients. However, our patients are humans, and they are individuals that uh, have uh, a lot of other uh, uh, issues around them that directly impact their ability to be healthy. So you did something very unique, and I believe that I've not heard of any other Department of Surgery in Canada, let alone probably globally, that has really made humanities a focus. Can you talk a little bit about what you've done at the University of Saskatchewan, specifically in the Department of Surgery? Sure. We About five years ago, we started a program called Surgical Humanities. Right. And this program is based in exposing our residents, our colleagues, our students, to the humanities. Uh, by humanities, I mean to poetry, to art, uh, to music, uh, to literature. We felt that that combination, the ability of us surgeons that are busy all the time taking care of patients, to be able to be exposed to the humanistic aspect of, uh, of an individual was very important to have this holistic approach to the treatment of our patients. Our patients are more than a a brain tumor or a a gallbladder. They're complex individuals that live in complex environments. And we don't understand those complexities that can affect directly their their health. Uh, We're missing a huge component of uh, our patients. And, uh, And after all, as physicians and surgeons, we want to make sure that we can treat our patients uh, uh, in the best, uh, uh, to the best of our abilities. And that means considering the person as a whole entity. That's interesting because I've, I've been struck personally by reading papers that are well, easily decades old now. And one specific study, I'll paraphrase it quickly, but I'd like to get your, your thoughts on this. There was a study that looked at 40 high potential scientists. And they said, they had a unique opportunity to say, well, we're going to follow these 40 individuals that we believe are really destined for success, and we're going to follow them for 40 years. It turned out that in this cohort of 40, eight or nine of them became Nobel Prize laureates. So pretty amazing for, for, for them that they even had a, a proportion that became Nobel laureates. But the resounding conclusion from it was those that went on to do these incredible discoveries in science invariably had a real serious interest in the arts or the humanities. In fact, they had either an appreciation for music, they played an instrument, they painted, or they had an appreciation for um, for art or poetry in that sense. It was overwhelming, actually. Um, and it got me thinking more about how is it that we... How is it that we can move forward to develop this creative mindset? I know creativity is a big part of this, and a surgeon's certainly creativity is a part of it. And I feel that from childhood to adulthood, we lose so much of that creative potential we had. And how is it that, and maybe I'm asking you for this magic story, how do you get creativity back, you know, back into the departments, back into the mindset of surgeons, and get them thinking that, in fact, if they take more time, 
they're more likely to have a much better opportunity within their own personal growth, but also their career potential and their ideas are just going to get better. Well, you're right, Tim, or creativity is crucial. You know, if you imagine an artist that uh, can uh, produce a work of art that does not exist, something that uh, exists in, in their own minds and can translate it to reality, that type of creativity to build something new, original, uh, that could have an emotional effect on the observer, right. is the same creativity that a scientist has in thinking outside the box and resolving a scientific problem. It's the creativity of the surgeon as a technician to develop new techniques to treat uh, uh, the patients that they have. So that uh, issue of creativity in science uh, and the separation of them have been a myth. And unfortunately, in terms of our education, you know, from childhood, we've been kind of separated on that, right? Yeah. You're either uh, an engineer or you're an artist. But um, promoting both, promoting being an engineer that can write poetry, that can be inspired by their poetry, right. or an architect that can be inspired by music, right. and, and, and building a symphony of a building yes. um, is, uh, uh, is really the way we should go. And that has been the effort in our department. We want to make sure that uh, uh, you know, our colleagues and our residents and students get exposed to, to the arts, to the humanities, well, so their creative juices can, can grow so let me ask you and this. can be better surgeons. Let me ask you this then. So when you first proposed this, when you look back to the day you said, okay, I'm going to propose this and I'm going to make this surgical humanities a program within Department of Surgery, what was the initial, what was the initial feedback? Was it a sense of this isn't, you know, um, I'm curious as to how the surgeons reacted to it and how the faculty reacted. I suspect it wasn't all 100% we're all in. Um, but I suspect now, when the, when you look back at it, or when these individuals look back, it was probably the best thing they ever did. And I'm curious what that journey looked like for you. Well, you know, the proposing of uh, bringing humanities right. as a pillar program right. of the Department of Surgery um, it was thought as something being on the fringes. Right. You know, maybe this fluff stuff, you know, what does poetry got to do with my ability to take a brain tumor or, or clip an aneurysm? Um, and, uh, and there was a skepticism in the department. It wasn't until we actually brought, uh, we developed what we call um, surgical humanities rounds. Like they were an integral part of our grand rounds. And we had it two to three times a year. Right. Where we would invite, for example, an author, Yes. A poet, uh, a musician. And once that individual started to talk about their art and the importance of the art to the human condition, it was click, uh, quickly obvious that the human condition involves their surgical problems that we have, involves the disease that we're treating, and involves the mind of that individual. So that connection was made by being exposed to these uh, artistic minds that were talking to a bunch of 100 surgeons um, about their own art. Uh, and slowly the program started to gain momentum. And I can tell you that the Surgical Humanities Grand Rounds are the most popular Grand Rounds that we have in the department, where we have 90% attendance yeah. to those Grand Rounds because people not only want to hear these other individuals, but they find value in what they have Perfect. to say. Let me ask this, on a personal level, for you, how have you embodied this, this issue of becoming more creative through the humanities? What is it for you personally, and how has it affected your life? Well, you know, uh, as you know, as surgeons, uh, our life is uh, overwhelmed by the work we do. You know, work becomes uh, the mainstay. Uh, you know, there's a, a picture that I always like to, to show, you know, I would like to be more square in terms of my, not only work, my surgical career, right. um, my um, uh, spirituality, uh, my responsibility to uh, society. And uh, so I've been always been interested in art. Uh, I, I, do, I do a sculpture. Okay. I do bronze sculpture. And right. to me, 
um, the three-dimensionality of the brain uh, sure. uh, helps me to be a better sculptor. And doing a sculpture in three dimensions helps me to be a better brain surgeon. Uh, so they are really uh, uh, synergistic activities. Yeah, it, it's, there's a lot of uh, transferable skill sets that I think we often assume just don't exist, but when you do it. Let me ask you this. Do you, when you are really looking for novel ways to approach a problem and you're stuck, what do you do to get unstuck from that? And, and I'll raise it with this way. We have so many of our graduate students at McMaster as one example, but generally, you know, we have, you know, people early career where they believe I can just sit at my desk and think about the problem and the answer will suddenly come to me. And that answer doesn't come. Or the answer they get is more of a fixed mindset answer rather than an open mindset answer. When you're stuck or you or you know specifically you need to be more open in your in your thinking. What do you do? Is it sculpting, or is there, or, or do you go for walks? Like, what, what is your routine to get idea generation? You know, and I'm going to tell you just uh, an example yeah. of something that happened to me uh, uh, many years ago. Uh, I like uh, visiting art galleries. I like right. uh, visual art, and um, and I never was that fond on abstract art mm. uh, because abstract art doesn't have really. Uh, 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 shapes of forms that you can uh, really recognize. But as I uh, 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 was thinking on the, the construction of art to its minimal expression, for example, only shape or only color, uh, that uh, the construction of complex art to its more essential elements was an inspiration for me to understand how, for example, we can uh, look at complex cerebral problems or cerebral functions such as memory and be able to deconstruct the one billion neurons of the human brain right. to um, a, a simpler uh, organism that may have 20,000 uh, neurons. So it is the same process that the artists have used to build abstract art the deconstruction of the system to its essential elements. That is a pathway for the study of the physiology of the wow. brain. Going to the most simple elements to understand the complexity of the brain. Oh, that's brilliant. So there are going to be individuals who are watching this podcast, and I suspect you run into individuals all the time who come up to you and say, Professor Mendez, I like the concept. How do I start? What do I do? Like, I just, I'm working too hard. I'm working way too many hours. I feel like I'm on this treadmill and I can't get off it. How do I build this in? Because the biggest thing is I just don't, I'd love to do it. I don't have time. How do you address that individual? It's like anything we do in life. Uh, you know, it is like uh, trying to lose weight, right, right. trying to be more healthy. At one point or another, one has to stop and make a decision. But, you know, one of the values of a uh, decision in terms of, for example, starting to paint, right. starting to uh, do um, any other sort right. of art, is that it, it becomes a pathway of another activity which is uh, outside your realm. It is a little bit easier than uh, uh, to... Uh, to really radically change. You're still doing an activity, uh, and it's an activity that you will find enjoyable and uh, will be able to uh, give you uh, a lot of satisfaction. You know, I, one question I've asked, we recently had a workshop on creativity, and there was a lot of interest, but also concerns of what, what exactly are we supposed to, are we gonna have to get up and say something? We have to do something impromptu? And the opening question that I asked the group was, do you not feel sometimes that you're not living up to your creative potential? And I'd ask them, raise your hand. How many of you feel you can do more? Uniformly, every single person raised their hand. How many of you have regret about not doing something that you used to love to do when you were younger? Every hand goes up. And that immediately spurred what became easily a two-hour conversation among 17 people, chatting and discussing and saying, these are all the things we want to do. And the question I had at the end of it was, it's wonderful to have these, I would say, momentary epiphanies about what I should do. You, when you lecture, there are many people in the audience, I'm sure of it, I certainly had it yesterday, an epiphany of saying we can do more. 
But having the idea and wanting it and moving to action is a very different thing. What have you found, and I'll make this sort of the last point to get your insight from is, what is the big barrier to people acting? Like when you, you know, in your life and you've seen it, you've seen so many people who have come to you. What do you see as the biggest barrier for people? Ourselves. <laughs> we are the biggest barrier to ourselves yeah. in terms of action. Right. And, and that's why it's so important to uh, have some role models. And part of our program uh, in the University of Saskatchewan mm-hmm. is to uh, bring those role models to the rest of the people. If a person that can say, well, if this individual can do this, can uh, not only be a competent surgeon, can be a scientist, can do art, can have social responsibility, maybe I can do the same. It is going through that personal barrier um, because we are the ones that are actually are the ones that are stopping ourselves. Nobody else uh, uh, stops ourselves. Once we decide what to do, then we can go through it. And I think uh, having role models, seeing uh, individuals around you that uh, have embraced their own creativity and getting outside their line of, uh, um, of, of the routine work that they do uh, is probably a sort of a, a, a window by which you can uh, proceed and act. Oh, it's brilliant. And I think on that note, I will tell our audience who are listening that really nothing begins until you do. And I think that is the key message um, today, which is be aware, certainly think about the things that you can be doing and take action. You know, I always say that it's easy to be imaginative. Imagination is having all kinds of wonderful ideas, but to be creative requires an act. You must do something. And so I encourage you and I Absolutely, absolutely. Thank Professor Mendez for sharing a few minutes with us with his insight. We'll post the bio, uh, the bio, uh, biography and give you content information for Dr. Mendez should you have any further interest about learning about the program and all the other things that he's doing. But certainly it's been an honor and a pleasure and I wish you all the best. Thanks so much. Dr. Thank Mendes. you so much. Bro. Thanks for watching Orthopod. Stay tuned for more episodes.